This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 215. My first note says personal updates, and I wrote in, I got nothing, which luckily, we have so much to get through today that I think we can just keep rolling on. Do you agree? Yeah, I I wrote nothing also. (laughs) So far away. Uh, yeah, one thing I wanted to mention that that uh, a paper that we mentioned uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, the author is a listener to the podcast, I guess, and they sent in an email uh, saying that they were very tickled, is, is the way they described it, to, to hear us discuss their paper. Uh, and they thought that we did a great job explaining the paper, which was nice to nice to hear. Uh, it, it's always it's honestly like surreal hearing that, and it, it makes sense though that people that would be writing papers on financial economics would be listening to our podcast because that's what we talk about. Uh, but it's still, uh, it's still quite an experience to hear from somebody uh, whose paper we've discussed saying yeah. that they listen and, and, that, and that we explain their paper well. So that was just kind of, uh, kind of cool. I wanted to mention it. Yep. Uh, crypto podcast. Uh, we had last week was was david gerard two weeks ago was quinn dupont uh quinn was another instance of based on the comments on youtube at least being both the best and worst rr episode ever so i don't know if that's uh if that deserves an award or something but that happens a lot with the crypto episodes uh D- david gerard last week uh staunch critic uh i mean pretty aggressive with the criticism uh and i don't think his criticism is unfounded so that that's fine but i was surprised that the response from listeners was was positive overall usually it's like you know there's a bunch of people who are angry about the episode and a bunch of people who loved it but with david gerard it was surprisingly uh surprisingly similar across the board where most people just kind of yeah i like the episode uh, one listener said that uh, it felt like a chat over a beer. Maybe that's why people liked it. Yeah, over a beer in August. Yeah, right. Makes people more uh, chilled. Yeah, um, right. Maybe it's the time of year. Uh, th- this week we have William Magnuson. Th- this was a, a, a. I mean, they've lots of been lots of them have been fantastic conversations. But this was another one. Uh, he's a an associate professor of law at Texas A and M, and he wrote. Uh, the book Blockchain Democracy, and he's written tons of papers. Uh, he's also got a book coming out on the history of corporations and the relationship with society. So you kind of get a feel for the flavor of the way he thinks, but I thought that was a that was a cool conversation. I think you like that one too, Cameron. Absolutely. Learning so much. Uh, so upcoming guest next week is Gus Sauter, the former CIO of Vanguard, and, and we had that conversation last week, and it was really interesting, really good guy with incredible experience and he was there right at the beginning of the ETFs and indexing really at, at, at Vanguard. And in three weeks, Colleen Amraman's here. She's the Director of Gender Initiatives at Harvard and co-author of the book Glass Half Broken, which is an excellent book. And in five weeks, Cassie Holmes will be here. So she's a professor at UCLA's Anderson School of Management where she teaches a course called Applying the Science of Happiness to Life Design. And she's also the book of author of the book Happier Hour, which I just finished reading. She sent us an advanced copy. I just finished it uh, last week. Loved it. Kind of like Ashley Willen's book, very similar, but it was great read. Really nice, good read. And that book comes out, I think, September twelfth. So she's on the podcast right around the date of it being released. Recent review from M zero one two seven one two in the states said this is the best financial podcast. It's the best finance podcast and in the running with Econ Talk for best podcast, period. Says something. Said we're curious and thoughtful and have a mix of nice mix of host discussions and guest interviews. It's one of my must listens every week and appreciates it very much. Recent LinkedIn, I heard from Richard. It's amazing who reaches out on LinkedIn, actually. It's so much fun for me. So Richard's a senior person with a large investment firm in Toronto, commented to me about the lag in private investment valuations and the implications of that compared to real pricing for public securities. Alexandre in Montreal, who's an entrepreneur, finds the podcast instructive and relevant. And then Alain from Calgary sent me a note, and get this, a pic 
a picture of the group she was leading in the Rockies, and they used the talking sense cards as an icebreaker by the campfire. Yeah, That's I love that. Pretty cool. The picture of the fire in the background was really nice. Yeah, that is cool. Uh, in, in the Rational Minor community, th- there's a topic in there called Introduce Yourself Here. So when new people sign up, not, not everybody does it, but uh, some people, when they sign up to join the community, they'll write a post explaining who they are and why they join and all that kind of stuff. And, and one of them, I, I usually glance at them when I see them come in, but I, I thought this one was worth reading out. Uh, so this is from Jamie in the Rational Minder community. Oh, and by the way, it's almost it's, it's at uh, almost 8,000 users now in the community, which is it's pretty crazy. I remember when we set it up, we, we were thinking like if we ever got to 600, I don't know where we came up with that number, but that would be uh, that would be huge. Now it's at eight, nearly 8,000. Well, I remember this package level. We took the basic package level. It's pretty, oh, that'll be more than enough. Right. I think we've upgraded twice, three times. Yeah, to the, twice, the I top think. top package. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Jamie said, I, I can't put into words the life-changing impact these podcasts have had on me and my family, but let me try to summarize some of the things we've done and learned since listening to you guys. We've been inspired to discuss and document our financial, our, our, our future and financial retirement goals. We have a clear strategy to take us there and have implemented it ourselves. We have automated most of our decision-making and processes so we can spend time doing other things. Our financial education has increased immeasurably, which, by the way, is the main topic we're going to discuss later on in this episode. Mm -hmm. Uh, We have been able to stick to our strategy through ups and downs as we witness some of our friends lose their heads. And we've been inspired to read more and have learned about subjects we never would have done had it not been for you guys. Uh, Example, Sapiens, Thinking in Bets, Dopamine Nation. I just thought that was kind of cool to see the impact that listening to us talking to each other (laughs) has had on other people. But that is our goal so very right. well put it's a great list and uh, they mentioned thinking in bets so Andy Duke has a new book coming out this fall which I'm looking forward to uh, speaking of reading uh, the 22 and 22 reading challenge marches on um, we have 567 readers in the challenge uh, we're getting new readers every week it is never too late to join this will continue into next year for sure so just hop to the Rational Minder website and you'll see the, the link at the top to sign up. And there's an app for your phone that keeps track of everything. And you can link with us. Our links are on that, that page. There's been 2,766 books read and there's 315 book reviews in there, Ben. It's incredible. And I wanted to give a shout out to one of my friends on the app, Amanda, who I don't know if you use the app very much, Ben, but you can look and see who's read the most books in the past 30 days. You can't do all time. You can only do 30 days. She's always number one and always like 17, 18, 19 books over the past 30 days. So I took a look, I clicked through and you can see that she's read 93 books so far this year. And it's actually really fun to scroll through and see what people are reading and see what they're reviewing. So I I, I really enjoy the app. I'm learning a lot, getting different book ideas in there. Um, So of course, uh, Time for our, our regular guest to come in and hopefully inspire people to read more. And we have a super guest um, this week. Uh, Harley Finkelstein joined us. And I'm sure many people who are listening know Harley uh, for probably lots of different reasons. Uh, he's an unbelievable example of a Canadian success story. So he's an entrepreneur, lawyer, and he's also the president of Shopify. And he is a voracious reader of books and applies a lot of what he learns in his books to his personal professional life. And uh, that's exactly why, why we invited him on. Ben and I know Harley pretty well. And so we knew of his, his love for reading and his love for learning. And the conversation was really interesting and some really cool hacks that you'll hear. Mm-hmm. But like, like you said just now, and, and like we talked about with Harley, they, they made reading an important part of Shopify's culture from, from the beginning. And I remember being around the offices in the, in the early days and they always had around the office shelves with books and all the shelves had the same set of books and they would switch them out as, as time went on. Um, but it, it, uh, it made it so that everybody had, everybody was reading similar stuff, gaining similar knowledge and would, would be able to speak to, uh, use the language that was used in the books to share ideas, which exactly. is pr- pretty cool part of a, of a successful culture. 
So that was a fun conversation. Uh, as always, connect with us on Twitter, LinkedIn. I'm on Goodreads on the Peloton CP313 and also hashtag Rational Reminder. Ben, anything else to add? Uh, no, I don't think so. Let's go ahead to the episode. Welcome to episode 215 of the Rational Reminder podcast. So this week's book review, as you know, Ben, um, is a reflection of a whole lot of thinking that that I've been doing, we've been doing. So this, you get to listen to me uh, kind of self-indulge in how I've been thinking about this whole hybrid work from home remote model. And it's... It, Can I say something before you start? Sure. Th- this is probably the book review that I'm, I'm most excited about uh, ever because... It's a topic that's important to me, but also I read through your notes and it's incredible. Not, not only the book that you're talking about, uh, which, which, is, which is great, but you've tied in ideas from so many other books that you've read in the last year, a couple of years. It's incredible. Like this is a, I told you, that you you've got to make this into a blog post or something. It's an, it's an incredible uh, set of information that you've collected here. Anyway, carry on. Well, that's a... Um that's very kind, but it's, 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 um, frankly, it's just the tip of the iceberg. Once you dig into this, I have so many more ideas that I'd want to put into this, but it would be a a two hour conversation. So I'm just taking the most recent stuff we've done, but it comes back to like, like you really have impressed upon me and certainly other listeners to use evidence in making decisions. And I found this topic about work from home and remote that most people have opinions that aren't really founded in anything. And this book, so the book we're going to talk about is called Running Remote, Master the Lessons from the World's Most Successful Remote Work Pioneers. And it's written by Liam Martin and Rob Rob Rawson. So Liam's a Canadian, Rob's an Australian. They built a a global company. And um, I heard Liam on a podcast with their friend Aiden uh, talk about this subject and I looked up his book and it just dropped last week and I ordered it on the Kindle and just devoured it in two days. Um, but this whole decision about how to structure the working environment is being debated and thought through by everybody you talk to, I find. And it's on every podcast about business you listen to. And there's just this broad spray of opinions and beliefs and I'm not saying I have all the answers, but boy, some things really start to crystallize when you're bringing up these pieces together. So we're, we're living through this as well in our world. So let's jump in. So six weeks ago, uh, episode 209, we reviewed the book Deep Work by Cal Newport. So this book, as you guys know, just hit me big time. And the message was super clear. So one of life's greatest pleasures is getting into a state of flow. And this is where the world needs people to go to solve today's great problems. And therein lies a great paradox for companies in that society today is distracted by all kinds of stuff, be it our phones, be it whatever's going on in our world. So there's this opportunity for companies to enable employees to get into states of flow. Okay, that's number one. And then four weeks ago in episode 211, we reviewed the book Fearless Organization by Amy Edmondson. So the main point of her book was that nearly everything in the modern economy is the result of decisions that benefited from effective teamwork. And effective teamwork comes from being able to safely share ideas. However, humans are wired to be fearful of sharing our ideas. Okay, so you park that idea. And then last week we had Jay on, Jay Van, Jay Van Bavel, episode 214, author of The Power of Us. And I re-listened to that episode, and I think about the same time you said to me, oh, you could include the notes from him in this conversation. And I just listened to that part that I thought mattered. And he talked about how groups suffer from groupthink to the point of almost becoming cultish and how you need to have norms to avoid groupthink. Then he linked this back to the need for psychological safety and the ability to welcome dissent in your team. And here's what he said. Dissent is a service you do to make it safer for others to present ideas that might be more innovative. This makes groups smarter. Okay, park that. And then lastly, as I mentioned um, earlier, I just finished reading the advanced copy of Happier Hour by Cassie Holmes. So she's coming up episode 220. So her message similar to Ashley Willens and talked about how much evidence there is around what makes us happy and then one strategy to 
become happier is to eliminate things that make us unhappy. Commuting is one of the least meaningful and least fun activities in her survey. So you link this all back to the book, The Culture Code by Dan Coyle, which we reviewed back in episode 187. Again, the main point from that was the success of a company rests not on the intellect or experience of the team, but rather on the ability of the team to work together as a unit. And the three keys in that unit are safety, vulnerability, and purpose. So you see it all starts coming together, right? To have a purpose, the ability to do deep work in a safe environment where you can share ideas, right? And this all comes back to culture. So you roll this all up, right? These are important building blocks to understand the benefits of working remote and running remote, okay? So I told you a bit about the background of these guys, but, and I, and I actually dropped Liam a note on this. I read Running Remote, I loved it. In my opinion, this is not about working remotely. This is about the benefit of working asynchronously. This to me is absolutely vital to understand. I don't care where you work. I don't care how you work. It imparted to me that you must work asynchronously. And then once you embrace that, you can then understand the argument for why working remote makes sense. Whenever you talk about working remote, to me, it's a very polarizing topic as people have very strong opinions one way or the other. Oh, our culture is based on being in the office. And then you ask why. And I've done this a bit lately. You kind of get these answers that go in directions that don't make a ton of sense after you've read this book. So you have to read this book with a real open mind to understand the argument. So let me give you the definition of an asynchronous management. So this is right from the book. It's the practice of leading individuals or teams without simultaneous or synchronous communication. All collaboration and information are funneled through online systems. Work focuses on individual autonomy, allowing all team members to maximize their own productivity without being dependent upon others to complete a task or provide updates. Asynchronous management requires process documentation, asynchronous measurement of goals, and the discipline to optimize work efficiently. However, we are all used to working synchronously, you know, real time, colliding with colleagues, just having random pop-ins, basically a land of interruptions, but that's what we are used to. And that I think a lot of people equate with culture. This book presents compelling arguments that working synchronously is completely disastrous not just bad, but disastrous for deep work and dissension and dissension. So this was by far my biggest takeaway from the book. Another quote, synchronous on-premise work life is a disastrous machine, a brutal chain of false starts that destroys the flow for every individual all day long. A, a distraction machine. You said disastrous machine. Synchronous oh, on-premise work life is a distraction machine. Yeah, I meant a disastrous distraction machine. So once you think about that, I think we can all agree that's pretty true. That's not all positive, and we'll talk about that. But let's go through the three fundamental principles of the asynchronous mindset. So number one, deliberate, purposeful communication. This is a big deal. So instead of doing emails that say, kind of in an unthought way, or not fully thought out way, just kind of put an idea out and say, we can meet on teams or meet face to face to talk about this and, and think it through. No, this is about being deliberate in every form of communication and be intentional on purpose. And this requires deep focus, put more time into that communication, into that email. So it's crystal clear to the person that receives it and they know exactly what's expected and how to reply to it. So as they say, process documents are not there to give you fish, they're instructions on how to fish for yourself. So number two, democratize with open processes. In an async, asynchronous, in an async organization, the platform is the office. Think about that. The platform is the office. Documentation is the manager. All knowledge is recorded and categorized so that any single individual can consume that information and perform any role in the organization without synchronous explanations of any kind. Now, 
I'm a little skeptical, like that sounds great in a book, but to understand the point of where it's going. Whatever you have in that process, it must be impossible to understand. I'm sorry, impossible to misunderstand. It has to be crystal clear processes for your operation. And the third thing you need is detailed metrics, not just grades, but they must mark a vivid path, as they say, for achievement and encourage complete accountability. Every role needs clear, shared metrics. Got you so far, Ben? And I know this is music to your ears. And they, they highlight that in the book. This is very appealing for people who are more introverted than extroverted. I, I would argue it goes beyond that. It just make it just makes sense. It just makes sense. I don't, I don't even know if it's about introversion. I, I, I think I guess the the uh, the inverse of that is that being in the office is good for it feels good for extroverts. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. That's what I mean. It's easier to convince an introvert of this. Right. Yep. I agree. Anyways, the past two and a half years, uh, many of us have been largely remote. And I think we've thrived in this environment. We as a company, um, we've been very effective and efficient, but we're trying to figure out what we do going forward. And um, there's probably no universal right answer, um, but every company's got to figure out, as we talked about in, in, uh, in Infinite Game, every company's got to figure out what works for them. Um, Anyways, let's get back to the book. So the in asynchronous mindset completely reimagines the very meaning of work. And here's some of the features and benefits. And I think some of these are a little bit controversial. So the focus is on deep work, which is better for the person and better for the company. You know, as Cal Newport said, reduction of interruptions. The platform is the manager. This one is a big deal. Meritocracy wins over ego, charisma, and power. The strength of your thought and how well you communicate it will carry the day more so than if you're a powerful speaker or physically imposing in meetings or more aggressive style. Next one, companies move faster when they collaborate less. Think about that. That's a, I think that's pretty impressive, pretty cool idea. Introverts thrive more. The experience of autonomy, freedom to decide on deep work and willingness to dissent is actually created by the async remote environment. Async work dismantles useless hierarchies and office politics. No more of the loudest voice wins the argument. There's less gossip. People are not stuck at a desk for a set number of hours. Work calls become more focused and employees are less tempted to waste time squandering their energies with bitterness and triviality. Perks don't matter. So the snacks, foosball table, nap pods, whatever. Perks aren't culture or true freedom. Water cooler chat and collisions, which is a very frequent counter argument that I hear, right? Don't spark creativity. Individuals do. That one I'm sure a lot of people will disagree with. Here's a quote. Lounge culture. Wait, wait, why? Go ahead. Why? Why would people disagree with that? Because that's the argument I have heard a lot. Well, what about that random collision? Ben, were you and I run into each other in the hallway and we have an idea? That goes away. No, it just means that we talked about in the Cal Newport discussion. It means you have to be delivered. But what are you trying to solve? What's the problem? Now you set up a time to discuss a problem. Well, you and I could say, here's the problem. Here's my thinking. Go back to the book we, we talked about um, on Amazon. Is it Thinking Backwards? The six-page memo. The model of Amazon. Like... Bezos doesn't allow you to go to a meeting and just throw out an idea. You know what, Ben? We should make the podcast four hours. I can't just throw an idea out without it being thought through. You have to write a six-page memo. So if I want to make the podcast longer, do it twice a week instead of once, I can't just throw it out there and say, well, let's just chat about it because that's a waste of your time. You haven't thought about it. I haven't thought about it. Neither of us have anything but anecdotal thoughts, which is a complete waste of time. Now, it's nice to run into each other in the hallway, so that's one of the challenges. Well, how do you replace what might be missing? But if it's about being thoughtful and doing deep work in a dissension-free environment or, or an environment that creates dissension and welcomes dissension, I think you have to embrace this. If you're going to work remote, you must learn the async mindness, period. I don't care where you work. I think you got to learn this asynchronous mindset. 
Yeah. So the question is when and how to go asynchronous. The book is full of all kinds of, of action items. Um, the part they say is the most important is a deliberate purposeful, purposeful communication. That's the most essential, those three fundamental, fundamental principles. Um, all communication lies on some sort of continuum between fully synchronous, like that live collision you and I might have in the hallway, and fully asynchronous. Knowing when to choose which mode, they say, is the key to growth and success. I'm not quite sure what the best thing is to do. Like, how do you get younger people as proficient as the more experienced employees of the team? How do you exchange enough to spur creativity? How much face-to-face -face, um, should you have? How do you do that? How do you accommodate roles that are more synchronous in nature? For example, we have advisors that meet face-to-face -face with, with people. Um, should firms be shifting some of their savings from real estate if they shrink their real estate footprint over to home office improvements to different travel models? Do you need to change the, the profiles of people you hire? Like, do you really need to focus on self-starters or people that love their freedom? In managing, it's a lot of, a lot of the book talks about managing people in an async world. And the biggest point I took away is that team leaders must go past the usual criteria and really understand each employee's unique life challenge, including how they manage their time, their work life, work home life, time split desire, their higher purpose in their life. And it's really a paradox they talked about where you have to get a lot more personal than traditional in-office hiring practice. So there's a huge section of the book on, on, uh, on managing in an async world. Successful people in this environment are not looking to be told what to do, but rather want to show what they have done. Hmm. Yep, I like that. So I got a ton of notes. I don't know how long you want me to go on for, Ben. I think people might get the point here. Um, maybe do the, the bottom line. Yeah. Maybe just skip, skip the etiquette maybe. And there's do etiquette. The, well, well the, the, the deadly sins, do the, do the, do the deadly, deadly sins. sins. Like, um, the deadly sins of remote team transitions. So we're, cause a lot of people are talking about going hybrid. So one deadly sin, recreating the office remote, isn't just recreating the office remotely. It's a different animal altogether. Well, uh, hold on, hold on. Does the book talk about hybrid? Oh yeah, very much because so. Because I've because I've talked to Liam about hybrid and he is not a fan. That's putting it mildly. Yeah, okay, so it comes through in the book. That's good. Oh no, it, it's it's Yeah, so that's the main point of the book. The main point I take away is the asynchronous side. So the main point is that hybrid is bad. Oh, it's awful. Hybrid yeah, yeah, is okay. awful. Hybrid is awful. Yeah. Hybrid is the worst of both worlds. Right, that's what I remember yeah. him telling me. Yeah. So another deadly sin is having meetings as show and tells. When it comes to taking up someone else's time, less is better. Another sin, not talking about the issues. Get behind the metrics, explore their deep hidden meeting and be open to every opinion offered. Right, allow dissension. Another sin, if we don't already know everything you want to talk about, you're wasting everyone's time. I've, I've got a friend who's a, he's an engineer at a, at a software company and he will reject any meeting that doesn't have a specific agenda and desired outcomes. No agenda, no attenda, as they say. Yeah. Another sin, drowning in work for his own sake. Repeat after us, thou shalt get a life. So happiness is a big part of this, right? And to be able to, because think about it. If you're happier not commuting, if you're happier doing deep work, it's good for everybody. And they even talk about how it's good for the community you live in. Right, because you might have more free time to do more volunteering, help kids' soccer team, whatever might be going on. Anyway, it's all kinds of rules and tools for managing async remote teams. So bottom line is everything you know about what makes an office tick has to be abandoned to fully grasp the remote ready async mindset. The core of the mindset is don't ask me what to do. Tell me what you did. If you work on premise, that shouldn't stop you from working asynchronously. That's the, it's it's that live collision. Oh, let's just go to the boardroom and brainstorm something. It's like, if you're not even thinking about something, like what good is that? Like you think about it, it's crazy. And the whole open office idea is crazy. Yeah. Um, B 
Beware of a mixed office and remote culture. Remote team members need to have just as much access to information and decision makers as on-premise ones. When you hire, look for people who are egoless, independent, and self-starters. Chit-chat comes with collateral damage, reducing our capacity to get deep work done that moves the business forward. Here's the line that you're going to like. Working fully remote is hard, but hybrid is even harder. Do not forget that it is our brain's natural tendency to put preference on those people and places that are nearer to us. That's like, are, talk, talk about lines that you always hear about this. That, that one's also super common. Yeah, we're going to go back to a hybrid model. Because, yeah, they, they equate culture to like the relation. This is my observation. They're, they equate culture to how people react to each other in an office. Just that feeling. Like when we were all in the office, it was great. We enjoyed it. Tight team. But that's not culture. Culture is how you work together. What you, How you get your stuff done together. How your team interacts. And they argue in the book that that can effectively be done remotely, but it should be done asynchronously. Love it. I know you love it. Um, anyways, um, let me just read one compelling paragraph that, that I took from the book. So here they go. We're not robots. We understand that most people instinctively prefer synchronous communication or at least think it's better. After all, humans are, at their core, synchronous beings. We move through space and time, facing all the inevitable distractions that real life delivers by the second. Paradoxically, though, it's this very unorthodox state of being that makes asynchronous activity so special and so useful from an organizational standpoint. As author Cal Newport brilliantly argues in Deep Work, the really meaningful work can only be done by working deeply in a state of high concentration without distractions, with all your energies hunkered down on a single task. For people to achieve the extended flow state of deep work, they'll need an environment that subtracts as much normal life as humanly possible while keeping present all the tools necessary to accomplish their task. So to me, the only question is, if you do go remote, how do you get the benefits back of face-to-face -face communication? How do you do that? And I don't have those answers. That's my big question. I mean, the, the argument that I've been making for the last few months at least is people can still meet face-to-face. -face. Like we're not, we're not working asynchronously because we're in a pandemic and we can't see each other. Um, and I guess that's different if somebody's across the country, but I've had lunch with people from PWL a few times over the last couple of months, and it's that that's nice. Um, but my my observation from that is all, and this is personal observation. I don't feel any more connected to people after I've had lunch with them <laughs> than I did before, and I don't think we work any better together. I don't think that we, I don't know. So I, there there, there are a lot of people at PWL that I knew, physic phys, that sounds weird. Knew physically, <laughs> knew from being. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I you mean? Knew, you knew synchronously. Uh, yeah, sure. Knew synchronously. And sure, it's nice to see those people. And I'm sure it would be nice to see people that I've never met before. But does it make me work better with them? Do we get more done afterwards? Are we more comfortable with each other? My experience so far, and I've, I've done this. I've, there are people that I've worked with yeah. for a year at PWL and met them for the first time a month ago. Nothing about our working relationship changed after we met in, in person or spent time together in person. So I don't know. I uh, I don't know if that's necessary. I guess I'm what is what I'm saying. The the seeing people face to face and having those relationships. I don't know if it's a necessary part of working with so people. I, so I had the opposite experience last week. As you know, one of our teams had an offsite. We went for a short hike and then a a meeting at a at a restaurant and private room at a restaurant. And there's things I learned about people that I don't think I ever would have learned in this kind of environment. So that's the part. And different people have different needs for that. So you have to respect that. So that's the question I have. Um, so we'll see. I mean, I, what I would ask is what, how, will you work better with people once you know more personal details about them? In this case, I believe so. I believe so. But even something as basic as how you communicate. Like in a synchronous world, you become lazy, right? Because you lean on the team more. 
oh, I got this problem. Ben will know the answer. Uh, instead of me going doing some thinking of what the Walk real into problem the office. is, Ben, let me. And like I, I just, I, I, I burn your time, right? Because you have to restart everything, and that happens all the time. Yeah. In a traditional work environment. Yeah. I don't know. I, 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 I told you I was excited for this book review, and it's not. It's not just because. I'm, I'm realizing now it's not just because it's a it's a good book, which it is, or because you tied in a bunch of other books, which you did, but it's also because you, as a, the leader of a firm with 70 employees or whatever we have, uh, you've been thinking about this practically for the last couple of years and just watching the evolution of your thinking, I think is, uh, maybe that's why I was so excited about it or one of the reasons I was so excited about it. And, and you you got to come at it open-minded, right? Like it's very different. I've worked synchronously for 45 years. Now some roles have to be synchronous if you work in a grocery store or you, like whatever. So not everyone can have this, but knowledge workers, certainly it's compelling. And if someone's negative on it, just ask why. Ask why three times. Why? Why? And this book is very good at the counter argument. So anyways, I uh, really enjoyed the book, Running Remote. Check it out. Uh, quickly, I know we'll get to the main stuff here in a sec, but I just thought there was a mind-blowing stat that came out that I saw from Eric Belchunas, who's the senior ETF analyst at Bloomberg. The Vanguard S&P 500 ETF is on pace to break all-time cash flow, incoming cash flow records. They're doing a billion a week into that. ETF, 32 billion so far this year. And that's twice as much as the next most popular ETF, which of course is from Vanguard, the Vanguard total stock market ETF that's done like 16 billion year to date. Over the past 18 months, the Vanguard S&P 500 VOO has taken in more cash than Goldman, Fidelity and ARK have in total ETF assets. Like the scale is just beyond belief. So it's neat to have that kind of in your mind when you listen to our interview with Gus Sauter uh, shortly. Uh, the other top five, there's some interesting ones. I saw the number five one was TLT, which I didn't know. It's the iShares 20 plus year treasury bond ETF. That's the number five most inflows for any ETF. And it's down like 22% year to date. Duration is 18. Good time to buy it maybe, I don't know. I guess so. Anyways, we got to keep moving on here. Uh, okay, so there's a journal article that uh, Dan on the mod team in the Rational Minded community sent to me and suggested that I read. So I, I looked through it and, it and it it was a really good paper. So I thought we would talk about it. Uh, the paper is in, Inferring Stock Duration Around FOMC Surprises, Estimates, and Implications. Sounds thrilling, I know. Um, so this is a March 2022 paper in the Journal of Financial and Quantitative Analysis, the JFQ. So uh, uh, applying... The premise of the paper is, is up applying the duration concept from fixed income, which estimates bond price sensitivity to market discount rate changes, to applying that concept to stocks poses a challenge because while the cash flows from bonds from fixed income are, are fixed, relatively fixed, uh, discount rate changes affect stocks through both the discount rate channel and the cash flow channel uh, because expected cash flows also vary with discount rates. So it's a tricky problem. Uh, the author explains that for stocks, expected future cash flow growth often increases with the discount rate. And he cites a bunch of papers for evidence of that, including one from uh, Ralph Coyen, a recent guest. Uh, estimating equity duration matters for portfolio choice and risk management. If you own extremely long duration assets and discount rates rise or change, say, uh, you get hit with big price movements. Now, if you're kind of like we talked about with bonds the other day uh, or, or the other week, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, if, if your time horizon or, or if the the duration of your liabilities um, matches the duration of the, of the long duration stocks that you might own, you're immunized. You don't really care about, uh, about those price swings. But if, if they don't match, then uh, extreme pr price swings related to market discount rate changes can be a bad thing. I mean, I, I think uh, growth stocks are an interesting recent example mm -hmm. where discount rates changed, prices fell a lot, 
if you're a long-term investor, you don't really care about that because growth stocks tend to be very sensitive to market discount rates. Um, but what happens is the prices fall, but expected returns increase. So if you have a, whatever, 80 year time horizon, whatever matches the duration of growth stocks, uh, you're actually indifferent about the rate change. But if you have a, a, a five year time horizon and you get hit with market discount rates rising on your long, uh, uh, affecting the prices of your long duration assets, that can be very painful. And a lot of people learn that recently, both fixed income investors and long duration equity investors. Um, the effective equity duration can be viewed as the Macaulay duration, which I'll, I'll explain in a second, uh, which is what we use for fixed income, adjusted by the co-movement between the discount rate and the expected future cash flow growth. So the effective equity duration, which is the, what this paper is about, uh, what the measure that this paper develops, can be viewed as the Macaulay duration adjusted by the co-movement between the discount rate and the expected future cash flow, cash flow growth. The Macaulay duration is the length of time taken by an investor to recover the money they invested in a bond through coupons and principal repayment. So that's the duration measure people typically talk about. Okay. Um, uh, the paper uses an event-based estimation of the effective equity duration using FOMC policy surprises as the events. And they're using the federal funds futures traded at the uh, CME to measure the rate expected by the markets to detect policy surprises. So they've got the implied federal wow. funds rate based on futures as the market expectation. And then they're, uh, they're, they're measuring surprises relative to um, the FOMC policy. The, the FOMC is the Federal Open Market Committee, which is responsible for open market operations, which is the purchase and sale of securities in the open market by the central bank in the U.S. financial system. Uh, so the event sample in the paper includes 47 FOMC announcements from 1995 to 2016. And the paper finds that the effective equity duration has a mean value of 41.22 years. No kidding. That, so that's long. That's a long duration. That's a long duration uh, asset. And it's just, it's kind of cool to have that number for stocks. Is that right? cap? Do you know if it's cap weighted? Uh, I think that, yeah, I think that was the, the value weighted. Uh, That's really mean, interesting. Mean average across all of the 47 events that they studied. Uh, so then they sorted stocks into duration deciles. So we've got 10 portfolios uh, sorted by duration. The average monthly portfolio return increases from 1.05% in portfolio one. Uh, so shortest duration, to 2.28% in portfolio four, and then it decreases to 0.01% in portfolio 10. Uh, so portfolio returns increase with the portfolio duration from portfolios one through four, deciles one through four, and then decreases from portfolio uh, four to 10. Portfolio one's got a duration of 3.39 years, and portfolio 10, so the longest duration stocks in this sort, in this sample, have a duration of 114.6 years. It's pretty crazy. So you'd expect a lot of sensitivity to rate changes or discount rate changes. Uh, firm size increases over the first six portfolios and then decreases over the next four portfolios. And portfolios one and two, the shortest duration, have the smallest size. The equity yield curve, which we'll put a, a image of in the video in the YouTube version of this, Episode uh, is hump shaped, so it increases with duration up to the fourth portfolio sort, and then it decreases downward sloping um, after that. So kind of, kind of cool. Uh, overall, longer duration stocks have lower returns. The hump shape in the in the equity yield curve arises. What the paper says is that arises from the co movement between the discount rate and the future cash flow growth. So it's kind of a, I don't know, kind of hurts your brain to think about it. Hurts my brain anyway. Um, so portfolio returns increase with the effective equity duration when the duration is short due to the co-movement between the expected future cash flow growth and expected returns. Uh, and then in, in their data, we see the cash flow effect dominating up until portfolio four. And then the discount rate effect dominates after that. Are you going to tell um, us why? Or is that, is that coming up? <laughs> uh, maybe a little bit. Uh, like, an what's increase going in the, on? Well, there's the, there's the two mechanisms. There's the discount rate uh, effect, 
So the cash flows being discounted at a different rate. And then there's the cash flows themselves are also changing. I, th- I think I think the next thing in my notes is about your question. Oh, I got your discount rate and rate of growth of of the cash the, flows, right? Yeah. It, 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 so, so here, listen. A, a, an increase in the discount rate pushes returns down through the discount rate channel, suggesting a downward sloping yield curve. All else equal, but because uh, but because future cash flow growth increases with the discount rate, cash flows in the far distant future become larger and more important, producing the hump shape before the discount rate effect takes over and the curve is again downward sloping. That is really cool. Yeah, it is. It is cool. <laughs> uh, the paper finds that value and profitable stocks generally have shorter duration, yeah. but among short duration stocks, more profitable firms have longer duration, and among long duration stocks, value firms have shorter duration. And okay. then, <laughs> I know. And the paper suggests that this might explain why value and profitability tend to be negatively correlated, why those premiums tend to be negatively correlated. Uh, now, that paper made me think of a different paper called Good Beta, Bad Beta, which is a 2004 paper, uh, which breaks out the CAPM, the CAPM beta of stocks into two components, one reflecting news about the market's future cash flows and one reflecting news about the market discount, market's discount rates. So you can see how that ties into the paper we just talked about. Uh, the authors find that value stocks and small stocks have considerably higher cash flow betas than growth stocks and large stocks, and this can explain their higher average returns. And I'll explain why. Uh, high cash flow betas, high cash flow betas should theoretically result in higher expected returns in an I cap M world, in an intertemporal uh, asset pricing world, because cons- and this is this is this is some intense stuff right here. Get ready. <laughs> Uh, because conservative long-term investors should view returns due to changes in discount rates more favorably than those due to changes in expected cash flows. It's kind of the comment that I made earlier about if your growth stock has just plummeted in value because of market discount rate changes, if your time horizon matches the duration of those growth stocks, you don't really care um, mm-hmm. because you, you'll you'll receive your value. Like you're, you're indifferent to the to the change. But if you have a short, if you're have liabilities with a shorter duration than the growth stocks, then it can be very, uh, it can be very painful. Um, a, a loss of wealth today caused by an increase in the discount rate is offset by improved future investment opportunities, but a loss of wealth caused by a reduction in expected cash flows has no offsetting mechanism. So that makes growth stocks, even though they've got a, a higher sensitivity to market discount rates, safer for long-term investors. Um, and then that safety for long-term investors is the horizon hedging demand argument for growth's lower returns in value. Growth stocks have lower returns in value because a lot of investors want to own growth stocks to hedge against stuff. And one of the things they want to hedge against is long horizon returns, which growth stocks are better at hedging. Uh, to use an analogy, to fix a fixed income analogy, a long-term corporate bond will lose value if discount rates increase. And that's irrelevant to you as a long-term investor if you're holding the bond to cover a liability matched to its duration. But if the bond defaults, if it stops paying its, its coupons, that is a permanent loss of wealth. And so following that analogy, growth stocks are sensitive to interest rates, but value stocks are more likely to default. And so value investors are taking on that risk, which is why they expect to earn a premium. premium. Anyway, it's just interesting to tie that into the concept of equity uh, duration, value stocks being of shorter duration than growth stocks, but then putting some numbers to it, like that average average equity, average effective equity duration at 41.2 years. Very interesting. Uh, that same estimate, I, I didn't write the number down, but the using the effectively the Macaulay duration, which doesn't do the adjustments for the effect on cash flows of market discount rate changes, that equity duration was like 16 years. So the effective equity duration gets much longer um, when it's calculated wow. this way. So interesting. Yep. Um, real, real quick. I had one other <laughs> quick paper. Uh, so th- this other paper, the, the actual retail price of equity trades is just fascinating. It's a uh, co-authored by Brad Barber and Terrence O'Dean among a, a, a few other co-authors. Um, they compared execution quality of six brokerage accounts across five brokers by generating a sample of 85,000 simultaneous market orders. 
just think commission about levels. That. That's, that's yeah, it's it's cool. That's very yeah. cool. Yeah, uh, commission levels and payment for order flow differ across the accounts. They find that execution prices vary significantly across brokers. The mean account level round trip cost ranges from uh, seven basis points to forty five basis points. And they have the brokers like they they give you all the information. So TD Ameritrade was the was the cheapest total all in cost to do a trade, and IBKR was the most expensive at forty five basis points approximately. Um. The dispersion in execution is due to off-exchange wholesalers systematically giving different execution prices for the same trades to different brokers. Crazy. So they, they used a sample of brokers with and without commissions. Some were accept, accepting the payment for order flow, some were not. And some were directing to the same wholesale venues, some were not. Um, there's no evidence that payment for order flow harms price execution. How about that? That's interesting. Because that's the thing everyone's worried about with Robinhood, about the you're getting bad execution because they're doing payment for order flow. In this this study, they're saying that it does not. It does not seem to harm it, or it's not related to it. But it's the amount um, you're paying for that order flow. It's the execution you're getting at the wholesaler. So the wholesalers, the big firms like Citadel, that are right. taking those, uh, that are taking the order flow. Um, the best performing broker does accept payment for order flow. Uh, another broker does not accept payment for order flow but has worse performance and still routes most of the trades to the same wholesale venues widely used by payment for order flow accepting brokers. Crazy. Wow. Um, they find that the price differences are due to different brokers getting different execution prices for the exact same trade at the same venue. I already said that. Yeah, I don't know. So it's just, it's kind of crazy. But it makes you think like I- IBKR is often, I mean, I think everyone's at zero cost now, but IBKR is no one for, I don't know, like cheap cheap leverage, for example. Um, but it kind of shows like maybe you're, as you would probably expect, maybe you're paying those costs somewhere else, (laughs) but it depends how you're using it too. If you're doing, uh, ETF trades with limit orders or something, then it's less of an issue. If you're day trading, then, uh, those costs will start to add up, but big differences. I mean, that's a 40 basis point different difference in execution costs. Very interesting. That's an unpublished paper, but it was cool enough to mention. All right, that was awesome. So do you think we should maybe defer the main topic to next time? Yeah, not not super happy about it because I prepared literally all day to, to talk about it, but yeah, that's but okay. you'll have like a it'll, vacation for the next it'll, time. It'll, 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 it'll give you a break for uh, for next time. The, the topic that we would have covered is uh, the expected returns of financial literacy. And it's, I, I, it, was, it was a lot of, uh, a lot of fun to prepare that, that uh, research, so. I think it'll be interesting, but in two weeks, we have enough for today. Awesome. All right. Well, let's go to the uh, 22 and 22 challenge with our special guest and very good friend, Harley Finkelstein. Harley, it's so great to have you join us on the Rational Minder podcast. It is a great honor to be here. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the podcast. I'm also a huge fan of you two. Uh, I've known you guys for quite some time and it's, uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, so we've known each other a long time. How you apply what you read to your craft as a leader, I think is something that, that, that we in the audience can learn a lot from. So let's jump right in. Tell us about your reading habit, Harley. So I sort of have two streams of, of reading. Um, the first is sort of an audio stream and the second is a physical stream. And uh, I, I know that sounds a little bit strange or, 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 or random, but I'm either one of two places. I'm either mobile, meaning I'm running or I'm in the car. Uh, and I, I simply can't read a, a textbook or a paper book, physical book, uh, or I'm sitting around the house or on vacation or, you know, somewhere where a physical copy is is obviously accessible to me. And so, part of what uh, part of what I try to do with with these books that I read is to take out the main takeaways, is to create a set of to dos or tasks after the book, things I want to do based on what I just listened to or or based on what I just read. And so often when I when I'm reading, listening to an audiobook on Audible or any any type of platform, or even a podcast for that matter, one of the things that I do is I, I simply say, hey Siri, take a note. And I find uh, it's a really effective way for me to capture some lesson, some tactic, some interesting concept 
in, in the book from an audio perspective. And so very simple hack, you know, if I'm on a run or I'm, you know, in the car, I just say, Hey Siri, take a note. And then I give the note. And then later on, I'll go back and I'll, I'll organize the note because often I think when you use Siri uh, on an Apple device to take a note, it kind of just puts it in kind of a random, a random section. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, categorize it very well. So that's sort of how, what I do for, for audiobooks. Um, for, for more physical books, it's way easier because in those cases, um, usually page three of the book, not numbered page three, but if you literally are to count three pages, the third page of most physical books is almost always blank. And so I will just make a numbered list from one to whatever, to 50 or one to 30 or one to 10 of certain takeaways or things that I, that I read in the book that I really enjoyed. And, and in both cases, what I'm left with after I finish the book is some note, some reminder that allows me to, uh, to do something with that. How do you do something with that? I'm really obsessed with how people take what they learn. I get you've got a list and how do you apply it? Because when you apply something in, in your professional world, that could have huge scale and impact. Yeah. So I sort of view um, books or whether audio or physical books in sort of three categories. Um, books that inspire me is sort of the first category. And, and in, in that sort of category, I get a lot of um, biographies. Uh, that sort of that that come up. The second is some a book that sort of teaches me something, and that often is um, a deep dive into a particular topic. And then the third one is something that entertains me, and I I, I find I don't this is a terrible term, but but sort of it's like storytelling about an anomaly, something strange that that happened. And I sort of slot all books into one of three core, one of three categories: teach me, entertain me, or inspire me. And it really is hmm. usually in the teach me or inspire category where I get the most amount of actual context or content that I can apply to my job. Um, so in the case of, I mean, I, this is this is going to sound hyper like like hyperbole, but it's not. I think the best book on management ever or leading a team is High Output Management by Andy Grove. Um, and uh, famously, you know, he ran into it. He's a brilliant leader, but it's an incredible book. I think that almost every few pages has a, another lesson, another tactic, something that you can apply if you're leading a group of, of two people or 2,000 people or 20,000 people. So in a book like that, hmm. um, I actually read the physical version of that. And so you'll see that I have like page three, page four, and page five are filled up. And over time, I've gone back and, and highlighted certain things. And then I brought it back into uh, like uh, in, I, I use notes, um, Apple notes quite religiously. And I'll have a section on leadership and I'll have a bunch of lessons there. And so I'll simply just just bring it back there. And actually in, in a similar vein to how I studied in law school, which was mo mostly just repetition, writing things, um, repeating things, writing them again, transferring one note to another note, condensing, summarizing that for me, at least that's the way that it sticks. Um, but those are really the three categories. And, and, and one thing that I, you know, uh, one thing I, I just want to mention is one, um, like many of your listeners, there is no, uh, there is no shortage of, of book recommendations that come my way almost on a daily basis. Somebody is recommending some book to me on some <laughs> particular topic. And often it's a topic that is fairly, you know, esoteric. Sometimes it's a topic that is kind of random. Um, people noticed over the summertime, this past summer, that I was uh, I was using my yakitori grill quite often with my family to make yakitori around the pool, and so a lot of people started recommending me a book on yakitori. And um, I believe I think it's called Chicken and Charcoal uh, is the book name. And like you know, if there were five people or eight people that recommended me uh, a book on yakitori, five out of the eight was the same book, Chicken and Charcoal. And so it's sort of obvious, hey, that's a book I probably should read. But more times than not, um, I'm just getting bombarded with book recommendations. And so years ago, I developed a hack. And I actually, I just read recently, I think it was Andrew Wilkinson, who's a friend. Uh, he actually tweeted about this exact hack. And I, I, I told him that I, I, I subscribe to that as well, which is if, if a book is recommended to me um, before I start reading the book, before I start making that commitment to read the book, I will almost always go to YouTube and try to find an interview with the author. Mm. And what I find is that in a very simple 20 minute chat with the author, um, usually, and you have to look at the date of the YouTube video, but usually around the time that the book came out. So it's almost fresh or the author is on a bit of a book tour. 
Um, I find by listening to a 20 minute interview usually summarizes the main key, key points of the book. And if I want to know more, if I'm, if I'm enthralled or I'm interested about the topic and the video makes me more excited or more enthralled, I'll, I'll almost always read the book. Oftentimes, though, I find that I get the gist out of it, get the gist of the book just through that interview, and I don't need to read the book. Now, am I missing certain context or nuance or more of a deep dive in certain elements? Uh, unequivocally. But there's absolutely no other way for me to keep, keep up with the, the amount of book rec recommendations that come yeah. my way, and that's the best way for me to do it. Hmm. What role has reading played in Shopify's culture? Um. I think I, I've <laughs> I've heard people say that Shopify is a is a book club uh, design uh, uh, disguised as a company because it, it plays a huge role. Even in the early days of Shopify, we've always had a book bar, and the book bar, you know, uh, it was things like uh, you know Imagine Inc. I think it's the name of the book, which is uh, the Pixar story. I think it's Imagine Inc. Um, is the one which is uh, which is an incredible book. But but you know it would it was. You know, you'd have that, and then next to that, you'd have crucial conversations, and after next to that, uh, you'd have crossing the chasm, and so there wouldn't necessarily be any one particular theme or category of book on our bookshelf, but it would just be filled up with books that that we always that we thought were interesting, and um, and then anyone can go grab the book and just take it. So even at the early days of Shopify, when we were a single office company, we always had books available for people to read. And I think the importance of it was the nomenclature that you would be in a meeting and you'd hear someone describe, you know, let's just say someone would say, well, that's an anti-fragile moment. Um, had you yeah. not read Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb, which uh, for those that 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 have not read it, that are listening, you know, fragility is is quite obvious and, and robustness is quite obvious. If you drop a glass, it breaks. It's it's you know, uh, it's it's fragile. And if it if you drop a glass and it doesn't break, it's robust. But what happens if you drop a glass and it breaks, but then it puts itself back together in a more in a stronger uh, mode than or stronger system than it was originally. That's what Taleb refers to as the uh, as, as an anti fragile system, just like the immune system might be in, in in somebody's body. So if you if you're in a meeting and you hear someone talk about anti fragility, you immediately want to understand more about it. Otherwise, you you are at a disadvantage in that meeting. You don't have the requisite understanding of of what that person is talking about, which which again puts you at a disadvantage. And so there's this immediate. Uh, there, there's this immediate desire, I think, by most people at Shopify, uh, certainly most ambitious people at Shopify, to want to understand the nomenclature of the company. It's sort of like the beats per minute of the company. And the best way to do that is to is to be a bit of an archaeologist. And I think the best way to be an archaeologist is to read as much as you can about the history of the company, to you know read old board letters, but also, hey, what have people read that they really enjoyed in building this company? And so... Um, there's no rule that you have to, you know, read every book in the book bar, but certainly that does create a great advantage for you. And there's, you know, there, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of books that I think are, are, are seriously part of, of our company's, um, makeup, you know, uh, Stanley McChrystal has got this great book called team of teams, which, uh, mm -hmm. general McChrystal, of course, famous, uh, U S general, but he talks about creating multiple teams, uh, like a team of multiple team leaders. And actually, I remember years ago when we were building up our support organization, it was, I don't know, maybe a thousand or 2000 people. The model that we used to do meetings for that organization was a team of teams model where every team can sort of listen in uh, to, to a larger meeting. Um, you know, more recently, uh, I read a book that I, I, my, uh, you guys know my kids, but you know, uh, Bailey's turning six years old, our eldest daughter. And I want to begin to talk to her about money. And I wasn't really sure what book I should talk, I should, I should read in, in anticipation of that. And I asked, you know, kind of all my, you know, my, my parent role models, meaning like people that I look, I look up to that are role models around parenting. And this book came up more than almost any other book, which is like the psychology of money, uh, by Morgan Husserl. And I read that book and immediately I, I just, I marked up the third page of that book, but I did so in a way that was incredible. That was um, with the anticipation that I was going to have to present this to a six-year-old, and that was a whole different experience of taking notes because I wasn't like some of the nuances of you know compound interest. Um, I didn't really, I didn't really take a note of, which I normally would have. But I wanted just to explain just a very general, basic definition of compound interest, and that book gave me tools to do so. Um, and, 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 you know, as I sort of think about over time, how some of these books have changed my life, I know, you know, you may not necessarily agree with, with, uh, some of the rhetoric around rich dad, poor dad, but I remember being given rich dad, poor dad when I was, I don't know, 12 years old. 
And just thinking about, um, there's this line in the book about, you know, when you want something, uh, the difference between saying you can't afford it versus asking yourself, what do I have to do to be able to afford something that I really want? I just thought that was an entire, you know, that was a mentality shift for me, a psychology shift for me that I don't think I would have would have ever received as, as a 12 year old kid, um, sort of pre entrepreneur, uh, and 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 that book did that for me. So, I guess to answer your question more directly, Ben, I think Shopify, um, the foundation of Shopify is based on our own insights, our own experiences, but also insights and experiences of people that came before us. And the best way to capture that is through reading um, mm. and, 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 and those books. Are there other titles, Harley, that come to mind that have had a big impact either on you, kind of like Andy Grove's book or on Shopify? I thought, I mean, one of the best books uh, sort of in the biography category. So again, books that inspired me. Um, I think Shoe Dog was incredible. I oh, think, yeah. the, I, I mean, I know it's well documented that that Phil Knight is a wonderful, incredibly inspiring entrepreneur, but very few books for me take you through a journey of that much vulnerability in oh, someone's journey. Absolutely. Um, if you read a lot of the other, you know, great founders or great CEO books, uh, you, you see a lot of sort of washing out of the bad times. You see a lot of, you know, um, uh, you, you see a lot of glorification of, of what went well and mitigation of things that didn't go well. And I think what, what Phil Knight did with Shoe Dog was, was incredibly brave. Um, he showed great courage to just say the thing. And he did it in a way that I thought was incredibly inspiring for me. Um, I, I just finished a book. This is a little bit of recency bias, but uh, it's by a mentor of my, a mentor of my father uh, is Charles Bronfman. And uh, he tells the story of Seagram's and growing up, you know, the son of Sam Bronfman, who, you know, wow. uh, it was truly one of the greatest entrepreneurs uh, of 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 the 20th century, and who who built an empire and and built cities and and community. Um, I thought that was an incredible book. The other, I mean, anything by Walter Isaacson, I think, is always really great because Walter has this inc incredible ability to go deep with subjects, um, and 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 get kind of on the inside track of them. I thought that was really neat. Um, when I first, when, um, when Lindsay and I are, you know, decided to have children and Lindsay was found, was, was pregnant, um, after trying for a few months, I remember, uh, asking around what book I should read about fatherhood or, or being a parent. And I got bombarded with different parenting books. Um, and Toby had actually mentioned to me, Toby is our CEO of Shopify, founder of Shopify. He said, hey, there's this one book that that is really, really better than all the others in his view, which was Brain Rules for Baby. And the reason I loved Brain Rules for Baby so much was it felt a little bit like a how-to guide as opposed to like, it wasn't speaking down to me. It, it felt like it was sort of helping me, giving me a cheat sheet. So, you know, very simple things that it provided me with that I, I still use today, which is, you know, parents naturally fight in front of their children but very few parents actually make up in front of their children so you know for for a child to see real conflict resolution happen in real time you see the fight happening and the argument happening in real time you see the debates and often heated debate happening in real time but often the resolution to that fight or argument or debate happens behind closed doors and 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 at least the way the book describes it you end up depriving your children of of that of the entirety of the journey. They're only seeing one part of that conversation. And so um, Lindsay and I, like you know, like most couples, not all couples, we have arguments, but we also try to resolve the argument in front of the kids as well. So that was something that that came out of Brain Rules for Baby. Um, another one that I loved was Carol Dweck's mindset. Um, there's a lot of aspects of the book that I found to be interesting, but 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 just the concept of growth mindset versus fixed mindset and my ability now to spot people in my life that have growth mindsets. And in many ways, there's a, a weird association. I, I, I'm more attracted to people that have growth mindsets, but I didn't have nomenclature for that. Now I do. Mm -hmm. um, whereas, you know, I, I am often confused by folks that I meet um, when we're having a discussion with something who clearly have a, a fixed mindset. And now I, I think I'm less judgmental um, about those 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 that have fixed mindset, because now I understand, oh, this is just their 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 view of the world. They view things a little bit differently. Whereas I very much, you know, subscribe to the the, the growth mindset um, side of things. Um, one book that I really loved, I read when I was a kid. It's a big book, but it's a fascinating story. Is a book um, uh, called Barbarians at the Gate, mm. and it's the story of R.J. Nabisco, and uh, it was just a fact. I think uh, it it sort of 
it also introduced me to like Henry Kravitz of KKR and, and, you know, private equity and hostile takeover. And I don't know why, but I read it as a probably a 14 or 15 year old kid. And I was just, I thought <clears throat> it made the world of finance incredibly interesting to me. Um, and in a, in a way that I'd never sort of encountered before. Uh, so barbarians at the gate is one. And then, um, I just started the greatest trade ever by Greg Zuckerman, which I don't know. Do you guys know that book? Yep. Yeah. We have I, I, uh, so I, I, I've just started reading the book. I probably, I probably heard about uh, Greg and, and the book from your podcast, but I, I just started reading it. So that's the one I'm currently, I currently have next to my bedstand. So you mentioned you have two daughters and I love your hack from Morgan's book. I think that's a very interesting idea. Have the girls embraced your love of books? Uh, they have, um, in their own sort of way, we, we sort of made books part of sort of the, the evening ritual. Um, all of both my kids, myself, my wife, we are fairly high, as you folks know, very high energy. Um, sometimes that comes with some anxiety as well. And so the ritual of settling down before bed, I think is made far better and far, far nicer, um, when accompanied with a book. And so with both of our kids, part of the bedroom, our, our, our bedtime routine is after their baths, um, we read a book together. And it's funny because some of them, you know, in, in some cases, I mean, it's always three. So I, I, you know, she's not reading Walter Isaacson yet. Um, I'm sure that it's disappointing to some listeners, but, but just the routine of the way that we drift off to sleep and the way that we sort of end the day, we sort of, you know, book end the day is with story time. I think is incredibly important. Um, and in, in some ways, I almost prefer certain books to the, like, I know a lot of movies have been made about certain books, but in some, in some cases, I mean, the movies are amazing. Uh, I've never read, you know, uh, you know, the Godfather book. I, I, I've been told it's amazing, but the Godfather's one of my favorite movies. I, I don't know if I'd enjoy the book as much because I just love the movie so much, but there's many cases where I just find the book to be so much uh, richer and deeper. And I actually think that the introduction of audiobooks has just been a massive advantage for this this topic because it me it means that um, my ability to find an hour every day to read uh, quietly on my own in a in a static place um, is quite challenging. But my ability to find an hour between commuting and working out and running and you know walking to grab a coffee in the morning at the local coffee shop. I can pretty much always find an hour and, and um, for for an average book, I can pretty much get through an entire book in about five to eight days, an audio book in about five to eight days, whereas a physical book will often take me in some cases three, four weeks hmm. because I just want the time. And I enjoy those experiences, you you know, on their own quite, quite, quite a bit, but they are different experiences for me. What advice, Harley, do you have for someone who wants to be reading more? Take notes, um, like everything else. You know, if you want to, um, if you want to get more value from meeting people, whether it's meeting mentors or meeting advisors, or you know, just going to talks of interesting people at your local school or college, or even watching TED talks, take three or four notes from those talks. Take three or four notes from an article you are reading. I actually think that one of the things you create is you create sort of this perpetual cycle of 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 of. Um, of like a, a, an additional desire or an appetite to gain more. Uh, I, like I don't have, I, I have a pretty good memory, but I don't remember every book that I've ever read, but because I have um, a directory of takeaways from most of the books I've read over the last five to 10 years or so, I have this appetite and desire to keep reading, keep learning more of these things because I can see a direct correlation between the time spent on that book, like, like a return on reading time. Um, and the way that I'm able to gauge that return on reading time is by taking really good notes. And then I apply it in meetings or I apply it in a situation and I immediately think about, you know, I'm really happy I read that book, which then that night encouraged me to read more, more of those books. Mm -hmm. um, and so that'd be one. And the second one, I, the YouTube one is, is so obvious. It's such a, it almost feel, I, you know, I almost, I almost was not going to bring it up because, uh, you know, I, I know your listeners are, are really smart, really sophisticated, uh, but it's such an amazing hack because so many of us are bombarded with book book ideas and book suggestions. Find, if you watch a 20 minute or a 10 minute interview with the author and you are just captivated by that conversation, there's a very good chance you're going to be even more captivated by the book that that, that person uh, wrote. 
And if you find it to be incredibly boring and you feel like in the first couple of minutes you get it right away, you probably don't need to read that book. Um, and and so, you know, I, I, I don't know why more people don't use that tactic that feels just so obvious. It is a great hack. I agree. And then we, we do similar things when we're assessing uh, potential podcast guests as opposed to going to read the book right away. We do the exact same thing that, that you just described. All right. Well, Harley, this has been fantastic. We really appreciate you coming on and uh, your your insights and wisdom are always valued. Oh, thank you guys. I'm, I'm, I'm like I said, I'm an, it's an honor to be on the show. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the podcast. I think you guys, you, you've taken a subject that is so complicated and so in depth and you've made it digestible and you've made it interesting and you've made it compelling in a way that frankly, I don't know. I don't know very many other people on the planet that have done so. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really a listener here, not not really a guest here. But as a listener of the podcast, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of all your other listeners. Um, thank you for doing this. You guys, you, you, you make the really complicated things digestible and, and compelling. And we're all grateful for that. Oh, thanks, Harley. It means a lot. Yeah. Thank you, Harley. And thanks everyone out there for listening. We do, do appreciate it.